Um, welcome to um, this IBE uh, webinar, where today we're going to be looking at our Ethics at Work survey and taking a deeper look at the UK findings of the survey. Um, my name is Catherine Bradshaw, and um, I'm going to be moderating our, our conversation this afternoon with uh, Professor Chris Cowton, who is Professor of Financial Ethics at Huddersfield Business School and also one of our trustees and Gwendoline Dendonde, who is our senior researcher here at the Institute of Business Ethics and the author of our Ethics at Work surveys. So welcome to you, all our um, attendees, and also to our panellists. Um, I'll just start with a few housekeeping notes. If you're having any technical issues, please use the raise your hand um, function on the dashboard, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question in there, and then someone um, in our admin staff will um, hopefully be able to help you. And you can also post any questions um, in the dashboard that you'd like our panel to um, answer throughout the uh, webinar, and we'll hopefully get to those at the end. Um, any we don't have time for, we'll get back to you um, after the webinar finishes. If you haven't already read our Ethics at Work survey, uh, there is a handout also in the dashboard that you can take a look at, or you can visit our website, www.ib.org.uk, and you can download with the European survey and this UK report. Um, now that's enough of me. Let's um, get to, back to our discussion, and maybe Gwen, if you could tell us a little bit about the Ethics at Work survey. Yeah, so here on the slide you can see the eight countries in Europe that we have included in our survey this year. And in addition to these eight countries, we also included Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada and Singapore. So this year, for the first time, the scope is definitely wider compared to previous editions. So we started this survey in 2005. And at the time, the only country we surveyed was the United Kingdom. Uh, but then we included four additional European countries in 2012, and now um, this year, as I said, for the first time, we have uh, data from 12 countries. Um, today, uh, we will focus on the UK specifically, and uh, we will do some comparison with uh, the European average, which includes the UK as well. Uh, so in the data that I'll show you later, you'll see these two uh, figures mainly. Um, here is just to give you a bit of, a, of an overview of why we decided to do the survey. So we wanted to obviously understand the employees' attitudes to ethics at work. And now, because we did it for the first time in 2005 in the UK, we have quite a wealth of data to uh, compare the 2018 results to, which is also very interesting to track changes. And uh, we can compare, obviously, the views of employees in different countries. And as Catherine said, uh, the full report for Europe is available for free on the website. Um, the methodology that we use, um, that Commerce actually used, uh, they conducted the research on our behalf, um, changed. Last year it was conducted face-to-face, -face, whereas this year Commerce did it online uh, with online questionnaire. So this is important because it might have an impact on, uh, on some of the results, and we have to keep this in mind when we look at previous year's data um, as well. Uh, we served the sample of um, 6,119 uh, employees across Europe and um, 764 of, of those employees were in the United Kingdom. And this is a representative sample of the working population in each of the countries surveyed. Thanks, Gwen. And Chris, you kindly acted as a national reviewer for us um, for the UK portion of this uh, survey. And I just wonder, what were your general thoughts about the Ethics at Work survey? Uh, I think it's really useful. I think um, there aren't many people have this, this length of experience uh, of surveying uh, on business ethics. So even though the methods changed, it didn't seem to have had too much impact. But I think you've got to obviously interpret changes on individual questions with some care. I think also what's really good about it, like when you're comparing company performance really, is to have some, some legitimate benchmarks and comparisons to make. So I think that the really interesting parts of where the UK looks a little bit different from the rest of the, the world. I mean, obviously, it's not everything you ever wanted to know about ethics, but I think the depth and the length of time that's being done is, is really powerful. It's a bit like taking body temperature, I guess. You know, it's, it's kind of something you really want to know about. It doesn't tell you everything about the health of the body, but it tells you some pretty crucial things. If the arm drops off, 
you know, what can you do about it? But yeah, it's it's really giving you some good basic information. I think particularly that it's from employees. A lot of what we read in the, the media is kind of like what the public think about business, maybe how, whether they trust it or don't trust it. And I think when you're talking to employees, that's really important because they're they're really the one group you can't fool very easily, aren't they? Yeah, it's interesting what you're saying about kind of taking the temperature of, of the eth ethical climate because um, something that we hear a lot of talk about these days is, is corporate culture and what does that actually mean and, and does the survey give us anything kind of t that can help us understand what the ethical culture of employees workplaces is like? Yeah, uh so um corporate culture is very is very difficult um to define sometimes. Um often at the IB when we talk about corporate culture we mention uh, the system of beliefs and values and behavior. They basically determine how uh, a company interacts with its internal and external stakeholders. So um we try to use these definitions and these indicators to understand the corp how corporate culture is perceived uh, in the United Kingdom. For example, here on the slide we have a couple of, of examples of this. For instance, we use the value honesty, which is um, something that is very well understood and widely understood by, uh, by people. And so, as you can see, 81% of people um, say, of employees in the UK, say that honesty is practiced always or frequently in their organization, which is um, a very encouraging sign, it's very positive. Also, we try to understand employees' perception of how their organization engages with stakeholders. Um, and for instance, as you can see here on the slide, 70% of respondents say that they think that their organization acts responsibly in all their business dealings with stakeholders. So we have, from one side, this very positive um, picture that employees give of their organization's culture. But I wanted to um, flag up just the results of another survey that we do uh, every year of the British public. And um, the, the data that you can see on the other side of the slide represent the British public opinion on um, whether business behaves ethically or not. So as you can see, only slightly more than half of them say that business behaves ethically. So there is kind of a slight discrepancy here that companies might want to address in terms of why uh, the British public has this perception of business behaviour which isn't um, that positive after all. What do you think about that, Chris, that kind of disconnect between employees and, and the British public? I think part of it is, is the way we tend to think as individuals. Um, I think maybe we think that our own organisation is ethical and we have some general perception that somehow other organisations aren't. So we generalise about things, often in ways that aren't really warranted. You know, it's a bit like the old, the old people. So I should count myself in there, really. We think, you know, so <laughs> mouth off about young people, but then they'll say something out, you know, about well, that's Sophie down the street. She's lovely, isn't she? And and uh, and yeah, this other guy, he always looks after his grandma every day. So so I think it's a it's a human tendency to generalise in ways which aren't always very helpful. Though it's useful to track it to see what the public are saying. But I think when the rubber hits the road is really what do they think of the organisations they're really dealing with? And I think that's where there's an alignment between, say, customers who are dealing with an organisation and the employees who work there. So I think the critical assessment is often about this particular organisation. And although culture is a hard concept to get to grips with, uh, we know it's not easy to get to grips with. We know it's not easy to manage. We know that from uh, many years of research and experience. But I guess what's really important is what the culture of your organisation is like. And do you have a feel for that? And I guess that this survey tells us something about cultures in general and how varied they are. But I think the question in the survey also maybe give us something to think about in our own organisations. You know, how do we think how do I think my organisation would shape up against the, on these various questions against other organisations? So I think it's judging your own culture and trying to manage that that really matters. And where do you think management fits in um, with all of this? Gwen? Yeah, so obviously the tool from the top um, is very important uh, to, to promote the, the organisation's values. And many studies in psychology or behavioural economics showed that people look around them, particularly to those in position of 
um, in, in senior positions, in positions of power within their organization to decide what kind of behavior is, is acceptable or promoted within, within an organization. So we asked our respondents what they think of their management and whether they think that their line manager sets a good example for ethics, helps them to uh, live up to their organization standards and so on. Uh, here on the slide, you can see the results that we got. And I think that we had a quite positive, overall positive perception of management, so, uh, which is quite in line with uh, the European average. And um, one thing that I'd like to point out that might be uh, of concern is the percentage of people who say that their manager rewards uh, employees who get good results, uh, even if they use practices that are ethically questionable. 33% uh, of UK employees uh, agree with this statement, which is slightly higher than the, um, than the European average. And um, this could be quite dangerous and, and it could be an element of concern. Um, actually, we consider tone from the top as one of the elements to uh, take into account to um, describe uh, organizations that provide a supportive environment to ethics. Um, and so here on this slide, I just wanted to show you the difference between companies with a supportive environment. So where, for instance, their, their leaders, their managers um, provide a positive example and are seen as a good example for ethics and organizations where uh, the environment is not that supportive for ethics. And as you can see, it's quite interesting because there is uh, a quite significant difference in some of the indicators that we could use to describe the company, uh, the culture of this organization. So for instance, um, on almost 93% uh, of employees um, in support of organizations think that honesty is practiced frequently or always, and they're more likely to be aware of misconduct. Um, they are less likely to be aware of misconduct, sorry. They're more willing to speak up when they are aware of misconduct, which is very important. And this percentage is quite significant. So we have 79% compared to 57 and uh, also, um, with something that is very important is that they are less likely um, to say that they felt pressures to compromise their organization's standards of behavior. Um, and so, Chris, what, what, what do you see to be management's role in kind of creating an ethical culture with the help of the survey? Yeah, I think Gwen's right about tone from the top. That's, uh, that's, that's clearly a sort of a necessary um, but I think what comes out in many studies is the importance of the immediate line manager. The immediate line manager really makes or breaks the culture or the environment for the individual employee. Uh, and it was interesting, I think that statistic was that 64% were honest or something. Sorry, should look at my... <laughs> but yeah, it was positive about line managers. So two out of three in this survey seem to be doing a good job. And I think that's interesting, isn't it, in terms of those who would criticize business and management. You know, the employees are facing day to day, they find two thirds of them are doing a decent job in this respect, but that leaves still leaves one third who aren't. So it's, mm -hmm. it's again, it comes back to this thing about the, the importance of avoiding big generalizations about, you know, what business ethics or culture uh, are like. It was interesting, one of the first um, pieces of, of research to, uh, to look at the virtues of good managers I supervised in Oxford 25 years ago and we went to it happened to be in an American company doing field work and we said to people just generally who are the who who are good managers what are, what's a good manager like and give us an example of someone you respect and it was interesting we were being deliberately vague we weren't saying we were interested in ethics good managers obviously did the job but also there were people who had high integrity it was really interesting just how much employees valued that and very often you know the example they gave of someone they admired wasn't the chief executive now or the chief executive previous who set the tone from the top it was quite often their first ever supervisor their first line manager so they quite often also set the tone for someone's career so so and i think that that comes out in here the importance of of line managers all the way down, tone from the top, yeah, but all the way down. But of course, they're using the tools that you give them. And I think one of the things that's most worrying is incentive and reward systems. We know that from the financial crisis about how banks were telling, telling staff they wanted a certain type of behavior, which turned out to be rather destructive in terms of mis-selling or reckless behavior. 
So I think the amount of thought that goes into incentive, reward and promotion systems is really, really important because in a sense, whatever talk you come out with in a business, it's the reward, it's the behaviours you reward that give this message to staff, this is what we really value. And uh, maybe managers either are deliberately rewarding staff uh, when they have some discretion despite their poor performance, uh, poor behaviour, or it may be that because of the system they're working with, they've got no option really. Look, this, this person has come out really high on these dimensions, they get the reward. And I think that sets up pressures on other staff. Do I behave like them or do I behave the way I think the company wants me to behave and probably I want to behave? And in fact, this increase, there is an increased pressure on employees to compromise ethical standards. And I think we found that across all the countries surveyed. And, and, and what do you think that means? Um, well, perhaps you'd like to, to talk to us about it. Yeah, so the pressures to compromise the organization standards that employees might feel at work is also um, another important indicator of culture, I think. Um, which we have analysed in the survey. Um, and it's very important, I think, for organisations to try to understand not only the level of pressures, but also uh, what kind of pressures employees feel, uh, so that they can then act and try and reduce them. Um, as you can see here on the slide, 12% um, of respondents in the UK say that they have felt some form of pressure to compromise their organisation's standards of behaviour. Um, and uh, the main sources of pressures are uh, that they were under-resourced, there were time pressures, um, I was following my boss's orders, um, so they're all very much related to the, to the workload that they had. Um, there are some, um, some types of pressures that are more prominent uh, in the UK since the more employees in the UK mention those types of pressure compared to uh, European employees. And uh, in particular, there's one um, I'd like to point out. Basically, they say more people in the UK say that they felt pressure because they wanted to help the organization perform better, which is quite um, maybe an indicator of the wrong type of um, objectives sometimes, because it might be the, the focus placed on, on work is more towards short terms profits and uh, long-term sustainability or success of the organization. So therefore, it might be that employees feel that to help the organization, they need to cut corners, which is, um, I think, a quite dangerous mindset because it might lead to um, risks that the organization then will have to address somehow and might be, uh, it might lead to ethical lapses that could also be very, very serious. And that Place to your point, Chris, actually about um, performance management and rewards and, and and how how we reward people and incentives. Yeah, I think it's also about the day to day way in which you you treat and communicate with your staff. I mean, I think you know we have to acknowledge that many workplaces are very tough. Uh, you know, we're working in tough conditions. We're, there's competitive markets. If you're working in, say, the public or the third sector, there's austerity. You know, it, it is tough out there and um, we have to recognise that. I think sometimes what happens with employees, though, is sometimes they, they kind of receive a message which you don't think you're giving them. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't mean you to do that. I mean, you truly didn't. Uh, so, you know, you can communicate with employees sometimes and you, you, they, they seem to have the weirdest interpretations. That's my experience as, a, as maybe as a hard to understand manager, maybe. But, <laughs> the message actually isn't there but sometimes people take it to be perhaps because they're stressed anyway um, but on the other hand I think there is um, a style of management which we sometimes see and, and I guess maybe it sort of echoes how we deal with KPIs so so what happens in a typical organization you've got your key performance set indicators and you divvy them up and you're a middle manager so you divvy up your performance measures to try to make sure that when your guys perform it all adds up somehow to you performing and and maybe there's a bit as well of, of kind of almost divvying up the pressure so you're under pressure as a manager and you kind of pass it on you divvy it up and you pass it on but perhaps just to make sure you get what you need to achieve you ratchet it up a bit as well and you can so you can get through the hierarchy a real ratcheting up of pressures to perform because you just want to everyone aim a bit higher because then we might meet the, the targets. 
And I think that's uh, a misunderstanding of, uh, of the full role of a manager. I think one of the important roles of a manager is actually to try to protect staff, not fr from being uh, punished for incompetence or being unethical or anything, but to try to create the environment in which they can do their work. It's almost a bit like gardening. You get the soil ready, you kind of plant the right stuff, and you then let it get, let, let it get on with it. And uh, I think at the moment, this I think because a lot of managers are under pressure, they're just kind of passing it on rather than seeking to push back sometimes uh, or just to protect, to decouple their unit a little bit from all the pressures. Uh, and I think that's a choice you have as a manager. You know, how much do you pass on to your staff and how much in a sense do you absorb yourself? And I think that's one of the things that, that sometimes is, is happening. And, uh, and that's why people feel that it's kind of get this done at all costs. And it's very hard not to give that message as a manager, you know, because mm. people, people, people interpret your actions, not just your words. That's a good point. Um, we've been asked a question, actually, which asks about what, what we think uh, respondents understood by honesty and acts responsibly when they were asked, asked these questions. And one of the... Um, well, one of the things that really stands out from this UK data is that UK employees have an increased leniency to questionable behaviour, things like throwing a sickie and uh, fiddling expenses. And I wondered, Gwen, if you'd like to start, tell us a bit about that and, and, and what do you make of it? Yeah, so we, um, we asked employees whether they found acceptable series of um, ethically questionable practices on the workplace and um, some of them are quite maybe they don't they don't sound very serious for instance making personal phone calls from work or taking pencils and pens others are a bit more serious as the ones you mentioned earlier so taking pretending to be sick to take a day off or charging personal entertainment to uh, to your company's expenses um, and for most of them um, UK employees are more likely to find most of them acceptable compared to the European average. And I think this is something that organisations can kind of um, reflect upon because it might mean um, that employees are kind of ethically blind in a sense, as in they're not able to identify the ethical dilemmas or the ethical um, element in the decision that they have to make and therefore in that case uh, they might need more training and they might need a bit more support from their organization or their line manager to understand um, what is the right thing to do and how they can apply their organization's values in their daily work. But it might also mean that they find those practices acceptable uh, even when they know that they are kind of not the right thing to do because they might be disengaged with the organization, with the organization's culture, the organization's value, and therefore they might think, oh, well, everyone is doing it, or um, that's what they deserve, they don't pay me enough, all these sort of things that sometimes we hear from people, and they are really, um, they are a red flag for potentially um, unethical behavior. And obviously, organizations can influence this attitude as well with appropriate engagement tools and, um, yeah, the appropriate instruments. And Chris, do you think that uh, UK employees are, are the, the least ethical ones in Europe because of this data? Uh, I think there's a hint that they might be, um, but of course, again, most of them, on many of those dimensions, wouldn't do those things. But I think what it points to, the fact that it's fairly widespread, I think, and picking up on what Gwen was saying about disengagement, I think sometimes it's actually very engaged employees as well. So there's a notion called the psychological contract which is in a sense as an employee, the sort of deal you think you have with the organization. And I connect that back to the very pressured environment in which we're now, many of us now working. So I think there's that sense in which staff feel that, well, you know, I'm making, I'm doing my emails on the train, I'm doing my emails at home, uh, a little bit of time to, to do my, you know, like supermarket order or shopping or something at work, you know, when am I going to do it? I think there's that kind, I think there is a little bit of kind of balancing out on many people, in many people's minds. And I think when they are being asked to do more and more, uh, maybe work longer hours than they're paid for, I say, when they are contributing often in non-work hours because of the technology we now have, and we, we collaborate with that as employees, I know, uh, I think this is sort of rebalancing. So I think that's a psychological contract thing, but I think there is a, there's another sort of issue which I'd be interested in other people's views here, which is, you know, there's always the argument, 
or question is this is pretty slow or it's Another thing is the camel's nose. You know, if you let the nose of the camel into your tent, pretty soon you find you've got old blooming camel in there, and you know, humps and all. So, you know, the question is that once you've rationalised these kind of behaviours as an employee, is that a slippery slope? Are you then prepared to rationalise when you breach something else? Or are you prepared to turn a blind eye to other people? Okay, you turn a blind eye to the fact you know they threw a sickie, are you prepared to turn a blind eye when you know they've all their expenses or they're questionable? Will you speak up? Will you speak to them? So I think there's a kind of, a, yeah, do, do these things matter? Maybe not. And maybe it's kind of rebalancing things for employees in a way. But are they a sign of, of, of different ways of thinking that might lead us and those employees in trouble in the future? I think that's a question. Because some, somebody said to me, well, in, as a result of the, this, this data point, that, that they thought, oh, does that mean that all the ethics programs that we're putting in, they're not working? Now, I know, I know um, when actually the data seems to say the opposite, of that, but actually it clearly shows the benefits of an ethics program. Yeah, um, it also shows that um, UK employees seem to be more aware than uh, um, than average, than European average of their, their employer offering um, an ethics program. So we have identified four elements that we consider important to uh, for an ethics program, for a company ethics program, which are um, a code of ethics or its standards of behaviour, um, ethics training, um, a speak up line to report misconduct confidentially and um, an advice helpline where employees can call to get advice when they face a dilemma where they're not quite sure uh, what to do. And uh, as we can see on the slide, um, for each of these building blocks of these four elements, UK employees uh, seem to be more aware than average. Um, but also, um, it's interesting to say that 38% uh, of employees in the UK say that their organization offers all four of these building blocks compared to 19 percent um, in Europe so there's a quite a big difference on that and also at the same time on the other half side 13 percent of the employees in the UK say that their organization offer, offers none compared to 21 uh, in Europe so there's quite a big difference in there and we also try to see whether um, this, having a comprehensive ethics program so having these four uh, elements could help improve the culture of the organization which responds to your question, I think. And we can see that, yes, there is an impact, there is a difference. Again, we see people thinking, uh, more likely to think that honesty is practiced at work, and their organization acts responsibly uh, with stakeholder, more employees um, in, orga in companies with an ethics program say so. Um, the interesting thing is that in the companies with an ethics program, employees are more likely to have been aware of misconduct, which is obviously, um, Ideally, there shouldn't be uh, misconduct at work, so it's kind of a worrying sign, if you like. But it's also uh, good, especially if we keep in mind uh, the attitudes that employees show towards these ethically questionable practices. So it might be that when an ethics program is provided, then employees are more are better able to identify ethical dilemmas and misconduct than in companies without uh, an ethics program. So it's ethical. They've got more ethical awareness and ethical acumen. Yeah. Chris, what do you think the role of ethics programmes and, and are they working? Well, I think the, uh, the results are interesting, aren't they? Because they do suggest that a comprehensive ethics programme, and, and that's important, it's comprehensive. It's not just, you know, just writing down a code of ethics and sticking it on, uh, on the internet or something. You know, we, we are talking about a programme of activity here. It does suggest that there is some sort of influence. You know, the, the differences between those with the programme and those with, without the comprehensive programme seem quite significant. That doesn't mean, of course, that you can't improve things. So, you know, you might have an ethics programme and it does a lot of good work. And if it's improved, if you learn from it, it could do better work. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a zero one thing. You either have an ethics programme or you don't. An ethics programme is something that matures and develops uh, with time as you learn in an organization. Um, but I think the, the, the final statistic about awareness, I think, I think you're putting your finger on what's happening here. I mean, let, let's think about law. You know, so if you bring a law in, does that stop people doing that thing? So if you bring in a law in that says you must not use your mobile phone when you're driving, 
Does that stop mobile phone use when driving? Well, it might reduce it, uh, but also it defines it as being wrong. And I think that's one of the roles of an ethics program sometimes, and this is maybe why people are aware of, mi of misconduct, is because they, are, they know that what they've seen is wrong. Whereas in some other organizations, they might just not see it as wrong, they might just see it as the way things are done around here or in this sector. So yes, I think in some sense, you see more wrongdoing when you're more clear about what wrongdoing means, but hopefully the actual level of wrongdoing, the objective measure of it, if you like, uh, rather than perception does, does fall in time. And of course, the other thing is that in, in organizations, publicity is important. Uh, examples are important, whether they're good examples that you celebrate or bad examples that maybe you highlight. And we know that as a, as a way of making policy real to employees. Uh, so you can actually say, you know, that you may know about misconduct simply because it's come down in the communication that, that someone has lost their job. You don't necessarily name them because they were uh, found fiddling their expenses. And here's a reminder to everyone, this is the expense policy. And then you know that you're aware of it that way. So it may be that a comprehensive ethics program does actually involve more communication about ethical cases anyway, because that would be good practice. This has been a fascinating discussion and it's such a shame we've only got half an hour. Uh, if you've asked a question and you don't feel we've had a chance to answer that in our discussion, um, you will get an email from us and we'll get back to you to um, to to answer your query. Um, in the meantime, I'd just like to say a big thank you to um, Chris and to Gwen for their time today and um, for, for a fascinating discussion, which if you're interested to read more, do look at the rest of the um, report because there's so much more data in there. If you're an organization that wants to pick up Chris's point to benchmark your own employees, um, against the national averages uh, of these other countries, do get in touch because we can offer you a benchmark service looking at the Ethics at Work survey data and your own employees. Um, so the next Ethics at Work report, uh, which we're going to release, is going to be look at, take a deeper look at Portugal, and that's on the 19th of November. So do check back on the IBE website then. Uh, so um, thank you from me and a uh, big thank you to our panellists and thank you for joining us today and you should be able to get a review of this just to check if you missed anything um, on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much and um, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. <laughs>